Um, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jesse, and the other, well, and, and the organizers, <laughs> uh, uh, for allowing me to give the, the first talk here. Um, I want to give sort of an overview of not just what I think are exciting areas in the application of machine learning in high energy, but sort of my vision of where, where this is all going. Um, and this talk is you know, meant to be a little bit of an overview, but also a little provocative. So I hope to have a lively um, question and answer uh, or discussion. Uh, uh, after after the talk, and I, I realize that some not everyone's going to agree with everything I have to say, which makes it more more fun. Um, so, just an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, I, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is going on in the application of machine learning in high energy, and in particular the applications of symbolic machine learning in high energy, which is an area that I'm getting more and more interested in. Um, and that'll be the first half of the talk, and I'll give an overview not just of my work, but some other applications of symbolic manipulation in um, high energy theory and, and tangential fields. And then the second part will be about kind of the future of how uh, the path forward to getting machines to do the kind of theoretical physics that um, a lot of people are really excited about. Um, uh, so first, I'm just going to one slide about the path, uh, which is something that I think machine learning has been done over the last 10 years, which is mostly what it's been doing is you take some tool that was developed for some completely other purpose, like convolutional neural networks for facial recognition or coin clouds for self-driving cars, and you apply it to something that's totally not what it's designed for, like um, top tagging. So top tagging is trying to find certain types of particles, like a, a jet of things in, in the a collider at the LHC, and try to discriminate whether it's a um, uh, whether it's a top fork or some other thing that's not a top fork. And this is something that's very close to my heart. It's something I've worked on for, for 15 years. And, and this was one of, one of my first collider physics projects was 2008, where this is some measure of how good these programs are. In 2008, we're able to get a single efficiency. And this, this axis here is kind of significant improvement, which is single efficiency divided by square root of backward efficiency. So this was pretty good at the time. This was almost revolutionary at the time. It started this whole area of we call jet substructure. Um, six years later, they improved it by a lot. So going from 2.6 to 3.4 is roughly a measure of how much significance the same amount of data would get for the discussion for the um, signal. And you can imagine, by the way, I set up this plot that machine learning revolution totally destroyed these benchmarks. And over the last, you know, after this, maybe the next five years, showed the progression of techniques, which was in this model of taking some tool that's totally irrelevant and applying it, and did better and better. Um, and then actually just, just last year or two years ago, they did even better than this. So it's kind of off my, my chart. This was from a review in 2021. Um, so it's getting better and better. And these machines are doing so well that it kind of makes you think, well, maybe we don't need to think about the physics anymore. We can just take one of these techniques and we don't need to do the traditional approach to understanding what's going on. We can use the machine um, um, to just guess the answer. And in a sense, this area of collider physics that I had worked on for many years is now dead in a sense, right? People aren't using, going back to thinking about the physics of these processes. Instead, you're using the machine learning first and then maybe trying to ask questions and understand it if you can. Uh, but really what I want to know is what's next. So this was an area that, that sort of was replaced by machines. What is the next area of theoretical physics that's going to be replaced by machines? Um, and that gets me to the kind of what's going on in the present. Uh, so if you look at the archive, you go to HEPTH or HEPTH and see what are these papers actually about? So what are they doing? Well, um, a lot of them are calculating something. You know, a good paper should actually calculate something or establishing some relationship or solving some toy model or extracting some behavior, some sort of toy theory in some limit. These are just general abstract things that machines, uh, that, that theorists do, but it isn't exactly the same thing that machine learning is doing, right? They're not really solving things analytically. Um, can machine learning is sort of starting to do this? And really, I want to understand to what extent machine learning can, can help with these more formal problems. Um, a deeper question, which I'll get back to in the second part of the talk, is what makes a question interesting, which is really what we want to know. Like, why are we asking these questions in the, in the first place? So the, the, the big picture is, yes, it connects to nature in some sense. We're understanding something about the universe we live in. Um, but practically speaking, what makes a question interesting is more like you can make progress on it. Or maybe someone else thought it was interesting and went and wrote a paper and, and you know, he thinks it's interesting, so I'm going to you know, figure out what he did. And then I spent six months understanding it, so I should write a paper too. She. Or she. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, or it's basically related to something else someone else did. So this is a much harder problem. The machine learning hasn't really touched on this, but, but I think it will. Um, so uh, again, I think a lot of what machine learning has been done so far in, in uh, physics has been data science where you have a large amount of numerical data, machine learning can characterize it in this multi-dimensional space, 
And this has led to revolutionary progress on a wide variety of physical questions, a lot of which are, are being explored in IFI. Um, there's much more to be done. But, but really what I want to see is how do we make this transition from data strength, which is hardly numerical, to symbolic um, 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 questions. And we know that machine learning is good at symbolic problems. We know this from large language models, which are really revolutionizing the entire world. Um, and physics has taken a, a touch of that. But mostly, we know that large language models are, are, are here to stay. Um, so what is it? How do we make this transition? Well, what physicists do is we take examples, and we look for patterns, and we generalize. Um, so a place to start doing this, to start exploring how machine learning can be used for symbolic problems, is to look at something where we have symbolic data, but discrete. And, and numerical in a sense, and that we have a lot of training data. Um, um, and so the idea is here to just figure out what machines can do in the symbolic arena and then, and then generalize. Um, so let me just start by the place that people associate with symbolic manipulations, which is pure mathematics. And actually, there's been a tremendous progress in the last five years in machine learning applied to um, various aspects of mathematics, in particular, um, uh, proof, ass proof assistance. And these now automated proof assistants, there's quite a number of them. Uh, there's actually a nice review from, from NeurIPS uh, last year that was kind of a, a tutorial. Um, if you want to learn about this, and then I'm looking at that, you can learn how to use some of these. Uh, but there's good progress, so, so it's challenging uh, because what mathematicians do in the crude thing isn't always so clear. Uh, and these programs are hard to code in, but there's been old progress in something which is very exciting called auto formalization, where you use large language models to translate actual language. You say what you want the theorem to be, and it translates it into these arcane codes. That's used here, and then it proves it and it translates it back so you can figure out what they're doing. And this has helped a lot. Um, there's other approaches like Fun Search, which uses large language models to write code to solve the math problem, um, which is also very clever. So, so there, there hasn't, these tools haven't directly um, affected physics yet, uh, but I think the ideas are similar and it's worth following what's developing in mathematics because as we transition to high energy theory, there's a lot of overlap. Um, so let me talk a little bit in the next few slides about stuff I'm doing, which is again in this idea of transitioning from numerical work to symbolic work. Um, uh, so the first example I want to talk about is stuff I did with um, two students a few years ago, which is the idea of simplifying expressions. So uh, this is a problem that comes up in physics a lot. You do some calculation and you get some really complicated thing. Uh, this is some these are uh, trilogarithms, which is a generalization of the logarithm. Uh, uh, but this isn't this, this is a complicated expression. You see it's complex, it has these complex arguments, and you expect that the answer should be real, so there should be a simpler way to do it. And you can't even tell, it's very hard to simplify these things. And there are some identities that you can use, but you don't know what identities to apply in what order to simplify it. And actually, there's no known classical algorithm to simplify expressions like this. Um, and so what we decided to do is to try starting with simple examples, make them more complicated by scrambling and training networks to um, uh, unscramble the expression. Uh, so what's nice about here is that you can generate your own training data, your own symbolic training data to arbitrary complexity. Uh, so we try two different approaches to this problem. One uses reinforcement learning, which is the idea that there's a bunch of simplification identities, which you can think of like moves in a game. So there'd be reflection, which is replaced with a dialog of x with dialog of one minus x, or inversion places x by one over x, or something called the duplication identity, which places one dialog rhythm with two. Um, and you can think of it like, okay, we know machine learning is good at solving complicated search problems um, where you have a bunch of different choices. So can we use this reinforcement technique, which is used for um, alpha zero and so on, um, uh, for this simplification task? And now the, the second approach is using transformer networks, which are what are used by large language models. And these are extremely powerful. But instead of trying to figure out the sequence of steps you use to simplify, it just kind of guesses the answer. Much like if you wanted to translate a sentence, one approach is to translate it word by word, but we know that doesn't actually get the, the best translation and you're better off translating the sentence or the full paragraph. Um, and we found both of these methods work, but the transformer networks actually did, did, did better. We were able to simplify things up to translate wait for. Um, uh, so this was a few years ago, and we wanted to then try a more challenging problem, uh, which has actually resulted in a paper that just, just appears today. So um, I just got this out in time for the workshop. Uh, so this is a similar problem where we want to simplify an expression. These are called spinner helicity amplitudes, which you get from calculating uh, Feynman diagrams, alternative techniques that appear in, in high energy theory. Uh, and, and there's a lot of physics encoded in this, but it's very hard to see if this expression is really complicated. Uh, and so actually, this, this whole thing simplifies to one single term, but it's hard to tell. So on the one hand, we have the same sorts of techniques that we have for the polylogarithm problem, where you have a bunch of identities that you can apply iteratively. And you can use reinforcement learning. We didn't even try reinforcement learning because it didn't work very well. Uh, but the transformer network can do the same thing, where you train it on 
simple expressions that you scramble to more complicated forms, and then you try to apply it to a very complicated expression. Um, so, for example, uh, you you we know this simplifies to this, and what I put into the network is I say, well, let me scramble this up to this, and I learn that it learns that this is the same as this, and then it learns that this is the same as this, and this is the same as this, and then it can learn to translate from the end to the front. Um, so trying this kind of out of the box with this transformer now can actually work pretty well with terms up to maybe 15 terms. Um, and then it starts to crap out when you get to about 15. Um, and the persons we're interested in can be a lot longer, a lot longer than 15 terms. So we wanted to try another technique. And we, the, what, we, what we found was very successful was confessive learning, which Jesse mentioned, and we'll hear more talks about it today. Um, but it's an exciting development in machine learning. So what does contrastive learning do? The idea is that you want to find an embedding space where a metric on the embedding space matches some similarity metric in the space of the data. So in this case, we want similar means they appear in some identity together. Two spinner relativity amplitudes or terms. Um, and close is some metric, you know, on, on whatever the latent space is. And the idea is that, that you pick some set of terms to simplify, and you apply the transformer and you repeat. So the, there's this learned embedding which is a, pre -trans pre a step before you apply it to the transformer network. So what it does is it kind of picks two terms and then tries to transform them and then plugs the whole thing back. And then again, picks two terms that are likely to simplify and, and transforms it. Um, and we did a number of checks on this. So first of all, you can do things, see if the latent space actually represents properties of the actual amplitudes. And we learned that it, it learns things like the mass dimension of the amplitude. So you see this correlations between the mass dimension um, and the distance in the in the latent space. Um, you can also see that it learns that the distance um, between the terms is basically correlates with the number of identities away. So the farther away it is, um, the, the less similar it is. Um, but the bottom line is that it works. And now we're able to simplify expressions that are almost arbitrarily complicated using this contrastive learning approach. Uh, so just give you an example of what we do with it. So here's an example. This is a five gluon scattering amplitude. You can input this to the network. And we actually have an app which you can try if you go to the paper, there's a link if you want to play with this, and it simplifies to a single term. Um, or this expression here is a 298 term graviton scattering amplitude um, that you apply it and then you get something which simplifies to two terms. So this looks really well. And this is actually extremely useful to people interested in scattering amplitudes because it, it allows you to see really what the essence of the physics here. Here you can't understand anything, but this you can start to think about it. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we want to see machine learning do more and more. Uh, for a final application of my own work that I want to talk about before going on to the more philosophical part of the talk, um, I want to talk a little about the S matrix bootstrap. So the S matrix, which I've been talking about, S matrix scattering amplitude, um, it satisfies a number of constraints. And there's an open question in physics whether you can completely determine the S matrix from just knowing its properties, like unitarity and analyticity, what are the particles in the spectrum, um, can completely determine what the, what the amplitude is. So uh, one, one application of this is unitarity constraint, which is a non uh, a non perturbative but also nonlinear constraint that relates the imaginary part of an amplitude to essentially the square of the amplitude. Um, uh, and, and so one question you can ask with this is, given the, the thing that you actually measure, which is a, a real number, which is a cross section, which is basically the square of the amplitude, can you determine the phase? Is the phase unique? And can it be determined from the amplitude itself? Um, so one way to set this up uh, precisely is you can just look at a regime in which it's a little bit simpler, which is this elastic scattering regime. So if you go between the two mass, the two particle and three particle threshold, uh, then you're guaranteed that it's two to two elastic scattering. And in this thing, in this case, you can write the amplitude as a, a, a function of the angle. And then there's a single angle, which is V, which is cosine theta, the scattering angle. And then there's a phase. So there's an amplitude B and a phase phi. And the question we want to ask is, knowing the amplitude B, can you determine phi? And in this case, the constraint is that the imaginary part of the amplitude is given by the integral of the modulus squared. Uh, and that translates into some integral equation. Now, this equation is really hard to solve. If you try to solve this by hand, you don't even know where to get started. People have played around with it in some toy models, but it's an extremely complicated constraint that there's no known uh, uh, algorithmic way to find um, solutions to this integral equation. But machine learning is great at this because this is just some constraint on some function. You model a function with a neural network and you find, you use this as a loss, and then you try to find what the answer is. Um, so the questions you want to ask is, uh, for what amplitude B does the phase exist satisfying this equation? And when is this phase unique? Um, so what we did is we parameterized the phase of the neural network. 
And then this mutatory constraint this integral equation becomes the loss function. And first of all, it works. So here's some known examples. The idea here is you give it B, this green curve, and this is the answer for the phase, or this is the green, and this is the phase. And, and in the neural network, we gave it the green curve, and it finds this phase here. So we give it the green curve. So it's an excellent agreement with all the known results we're able to find. Uh, but then you can do something else, which is search for new solutions. So there's an interesting result from Andre Martin from 1967, which he proposed this thing here. This is some complicated functional of the amplitude. Um, and he suggested that this sine mu, whatever it is, is some indicator of whether there should be a phase. And he proved something about it, which is that if it's less than one for a given amplitude, then there's always a phase. But where did this come from? Can you understand where sine mu comes from, from machine learning? Um, we found this interesting result that uh, if this is a, so in some two dimensional parameterization of possible functions, this is the contours of this thing that Andre came up with. Um, but if you use machine learning and you just search for a phase for the same functions, you find that the loss landscape looks exactly like sine mu. So here we're not telling it anything about sine mu, but it looks like an identical, identical plot. And what this suggests is machine learning could suggest that you can find functionals like this, which are useful. Um, uh, let me kind of go through this a little quickly because um, I want to get on to the next part of the talk. But we found some other results. So we found new, using this machine learning approach, you can parameterize two different phases with neural networks and have a repulsive loss to make sure they're different. And then you can do a kind of a search in the space to find new solutions. And we found uh, basically what in 1977, the best solution they found was a phase ambiguous solution, meaning there's the same amplitude, two different phases, and sine mu 215. 2.15, and we found solutions of lower sine mu. You can do this better, but we kind of stopped here. Um, and there's an open question of whether you can get down to one. Uh, but we just wanted to kind of prove the principle that machine learning is useful for these symbolic problems. Um, okay. Uh, finally, I just have one slide about string theory. So I'm not an expert on this, but but Fabian is, who's one of the organizers here, and he can he can take your questions. Um, but he had this nice review um, just a few months ago with Jim Halverson and Sergey Gukov. Uh, and, and string theory is, is really, there's a lot of symbolic questions, but they do the same thing where you say, well, let's find something that we can approach them numerically to see if machine learning can help. And there's a really interesting question, which is, so there's this, there's, we've all heard about kalabi yau metrics, which is a way to compactify string theory. And Kalabi proved that these metrics exist. So if you have a kalabi yau manifold, there must be some metric for it, which has some properties. Um, but it didn't give you a constructive algorithm for constructing those metrics given the manifold. And uh, what, what uh, so Bert Albert and his collaborators were able to show that you can use machine learning to find metrics numerically uh, using some loss function, which is the flatness of these metrics. And then uh, Jim and Fabian actually found a way to, to improve this using metric flows, which were solving the differential equation. And so now we're able to construct metrics, which is the first step in actually trying to locate the standard model in. In, in string theory, where now you can use the metric, compute the spectrum, and then go back and ask, well, maybe we can find a different manifold to go back to buy on to get something closer to the standard model. Um, and there's other reserves in string theory, but just just there's an interesting development in this field that's worth following. Okay, so that's a broad overview of what's going on. And um, what I want to talk about in the second half of the talk is where I see this all going. So we're kind of exploring and figuring out how to use symbolic manipulation to do problems of interest in high energy theory. Uh, but it's not so easy to see how this is going to be able to kind of replace the day jobs of the average theoretical physicist. Um, and to that, I think large language models are really the key. So let me just review what's going on with large language models. So large language models have revolutionized all areas of, of I don't know, human activity, pretty much, or they're starting to, and certainly will in the next five years. But what's interesting is they have this kind of exponential growth in complexity. So this is the number of parameters in the network. Roughly, we don't really know how many parameters are in GPT-4, but it's something, you know, 100 trillion or so. Um, and there's an exponential growth in the complexity of the network. Um, and what's interesting is that, that where we are today, these networks have roughly 100 trillion parameters, which is roughly the size of the human brain. The number of synapses in the human brain is roughly 100, 100 trillion, right? So where these old ones, GPT-4, might have been a cat brain, but the human brain um, is where they, where they are now. So it's maybe not a coincidence that the machines are now doing things that are compatible with, with human tasks. They're able to write um, articles better than most humans or do you know, graphic design better than humans or generate videos and images better than humans because they have comparable complexity to humans that didn't a few years ago. Um, 
And so that's just interesting statistic. Another statistic is the they have actually more compute is used to construct these networks than are we using the human brain. So the brain is roughly, you know, you can estimate this roughly 10 to the 16 floating point operations per second over a lifetime gives you 10 to the 22 operations. And the training time for these is roughly 10 to the 25 operations. So they have the kind of intellectual capacity of the human brain by some measure. Of course, they can't do all the things humans can do, but we're kind of at this point where there's an intersection in the complexity of large language models and humans. Here's another perspective on it. So that same curve I have is now vertical, um, but you can also plot the complexity of mammalian brains. So the number of synapses. So here, the, the x-axis is the divergence evolutionary scale. So about 100 million years ago, we diverged from a mouse. And you can see there's a kind of exponential increase in the complexity of the mammalian brain. Um, but the difference is that the mammalian brain goes by a factor of two in a million years, while machines go by a factor of 10 in one year. So they're both exponential, but they differ by a factor of a million in the exponent. And for you guys who understand what exponents are, that's that's incredible. And so there's this open, this intersection point where two exponential curves increase, intersect, and that happens to be today, you know, plus or minus five years, right? But that's pretty amazing that we're now at this very special time in the evolution of intelligence where machines and, and <laughs> mammals are comparable intelligence. And the question is, will it keep growing, right? And, and it may not be continued exponential growth, but even sub-exponential growth will still make these machines much, much smarter than we are very, very soon. And we have to take this seriously because this is the future that's happening now. And again, every year they're doubling. Um, and what I want to do a little bit is kind of unpack this a little and ask, well, should we expect them to, to keep growing? What can they do that we can't grow? And um, uh, how will it affect the future of, of intellectual exercise? Um, so the first question you can say, well, now they're training on all the data on the internet. So um, we're going to run out of data and we're going to run out of computing power, or run out of energy, so it can't continue. But that's not really true. And there was an interesting study earlier this year, um, which was trying to, to break down how much of the progress came from data and compute and how much of it came from algorithmic advances. Um, so they, they tried to control for these different um, contributions. And what they found is the algorithmic doubling time, so the the, the by some measure of, of performance of these networks, if you just look at algorithmic importances of improvement, holding the data and compute the same, um, it doubles in, in roughly a year, right? So instead of a factor of 10 in a year, you get a factor of two just from the algorithmic improvement. So even if we never get any more data, these machines are still gonna get better and better just by algorithmic improvement. So I, mean, I think this is very important. Um, uh, but you can say, well, machines, you know, they can compute things, but they're never going to be something fundamentally human about our explorations in, in physics that requires a kind of creativity that machines can never do. Because all they're doing is reciting stuff they've seen. They're looking on the internet and repeating things and repackaging it, and they're not creative like humans. Um, but actually, this is wrong. And in fact, machines are much more creative than people. People are not creative. I, I hope I don't offend anybody. Uh, we like to think we're creative, but the average human is not creative at all. And even the most exceptional human is not as creative as, as a machine. So people have actually quantified this as well using something called the Torn's test of creative thinking, which is a very old test that wasn't designed for machine learning. But this test asks you things like, how many ways can you think of to use a water bottle? Or suppose you can be invisible for a day, what problems might that create? Or what would be the benefits of being invisible? Um, and they gave this test to a bunch of people. These are these um, uh, controls, and then they gave it to GPT. And GPT did both perfectly on all the tests, and the humans did okay. Um, so GPT-4 is more creative than 99% of humans. And I encourage you to test this yourself. Think about any measure of creativity you can come up with, and then see if ChatGPT can, can beat uh, your friend at this measure. I mean, in fact, you're just asking it, so, so here, how many ways can you think of use a water bottle? Here's what GPT says. Well, okay, you can use a drinking container, Send water or wait for exercise, ice pack, bird feeder, storage container, funnel, piggy bank, right? Just spits these out immediately. I mean, it would take you, you know, 20 minutes to come up with these. Ask it more, okay, come up with more, be very creative. It just keeps spitting them out over and over again, right? It just goes on forever. Miniature slow globe, DII, kayak outrigger, food <laughs> shaper, you know, uh, water filtration experiment, mini greenhouse. It's it just, you know, lots and lots of ideas. Yes, maybe it's learning this from the internet, but that's what we do too. You know, we inspire our creativity based on things we've seen. Machines are very, very creative. Uh, but here's the here's the real point. So what what there's another study, this was done um, of last year, uh, asking how machine learning can actually help people at their jobs. So what they did is they took some management consultants and they gave them large language models and they had a control group which didn't use AI. And then they asked some other people to use AI. 
And they found that by some measure of quality, um, the people who used AI did always better, but significantly better. And they did the ones with AI did better than anyone without AI could possibly do. Um, and this is a significant improvement in the quality and the productivity of the people they tested. Um, and what's even more interesting is that the, the bottom half improved by 43%, the top half improved by 17%. So it's true that the people on the lower end um, improved more, but of course there's more that they can improve, but also the people, the best people also were able to benefit from the use of, of AI. And what it's doing is you can't really see it here, but it's kind of narrowing, the, this green curve is narrower than the blue curve, and it's getting people to be better and also more, more, more similar. Um, and, and that's what the, the, the introduction to the title of this of this talk, which is the same thing is going to happen with, with physics, right? If you ask, well, how do we think about theoretical physics? You know, if you think about historically, there's a few big names that come up, you know, Newton and Einstein and, and Feynman, who, you know, you say, well, machine learning is really, I mean, physics is really the, the domain of a few geniuses, and everyone else is just trying to catch up. And I have GPT if you think this is true. Is progress in theoretical physics due to the outsized contribution of a small number of individuals? Individuals, yes, they think so. Progress is, like many fields of science, driven by outsized contributions of a few. And so there's a few people on the end of the bell curve um, that are doing um, um, the, the hard work, and everyone else is just trying to catch up. Now, this is obviously very controversial, and there's different, you can have debates in the philosophy of science, but there is a sense in which um, uh, uh, certain people have an outsized influence, at least in popular culture, on um, 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 improvement in things. So what's going to happen? Well, if we do the same thing with AI, it's going to shift this curve over, right? So if you have some some experiment, some accomplishment that it took an Einstein to do, and there was only one Einstein in 100 years, uh, when you shift the curves on that, you have 10,000 Einsteins um, working at the same time. And that's really what, what AI is going to do for us. It'll help us. It'll help the mediocre physicists like me be better at what we do. Um, and I think that's really what, what AI, these large language models are going to do. And you can see this already. I mean, it's, it's, it's already happening. I don't know how many of you use AI in your in your day-to-day -day life, but I use ChatGPT all the time. Any project I have, formal theoretical questions, I'm always going back and forth with ChatGPT um, and other large language models and asking it for help and orientation and, and give me references and explain something to me and uploading papers. And, and this is already augmenting our intelligence um, in a way that will only get better. Um, and so now just taking a step back, you know, going back to the question of what can machines do, what are the questions we're interested in? And I think it's worth just taking perspective on, on what is going on in high energy physics. And a lot of, I know a lot of graduate students are struggling with these questions and a lot of faculty are as well. Uh, so, you know, we usually have some goal we're trying to get to in physics. Um, and as we go along, we kind of hit some dead ends and we have to go back. And, but there's slow and steady progress towards the goal of, you know, making better calculations, explaining nature better, having predictions that are in better agreement or some more deeper fundamental understanding. Um, but but some sense, if you take a step back, it looks like progress, at least in high energy theoretical physics, might have stalled a little. There's some goal we have, some grand unified theory, theory of everything. Um, we have some sense of what it is. And as we're going there, we keep hitting a lot more dead ends than maybe we expect. And, and we have some idea, okay, maybe, okay, there's something with gravity that might be relevant. Oh, we have some theory with some spin two excitation. It looks like a string. Let's study this. Oh, it needs to be in 10 dimensions. Let's study multidimensional strings. Well, it's supersymmetric. Let's study toy supersymmetric models. And you kind of go off in these tangents and, and you start studying things. And it's not always so clear whether the things you're studying are anywhere getting you closer to where you're going. Um, and, and maybe the problems are just too difficult for us. Like, suppose that were true. Human beings are not capable of understanding the theory of everything. You know, like a cat may not be capable of understanding chess. Then what would you expect to happen? You expect something like this, where we go and we hit dead ends and we kind of go off and we're not really making any forward progress because, you know, it's like cats knocking around chess pieces. You know, it looks okay maybe if you're, if you're dumber than a cat. Uh, the mouse doesn't know what the cat's doing. But you know, if it's a bunch of cats sitting around playing chess, they, you know, they're maybe fooling each other. But um, you know, so so I think this is kind of indicative that maybe something is missing. Um, so what is our limitation? Why can't we do it? What is it possible that there might be need to understand this theory that humans can't do? Well, one thing is we're limited by our biology. So you know, can we do things like visualize? Let's say I don't understand this data. Let me project it into two dimensions and draw a line through it. Oh, now I understand the data because I have a line. Right, so I project it to something in 2D. Well, why are we doing this? Because we have eyes and we see in 2D projections, right? So we love 2D projections because we have these 
these weird fleshy orbs with some liquid in it in our head, right? But machines don't do that, right? Machines can visualize in D dimensions. There's absolutely nothing special about 2D and 2D projection for machines. In fact, the word visualize, vision, is something special to, to uh, animals, right? Eyes have nothing to do with high energy physics or particle physics. So the fact that we're limited and say, ah, oh, we don't understand the data unless we can do this, is really a limitation. It's a crutch that we need, but it shouldn't be necessary. And forcing us to take really powerful machine learning techniques and saying, oh, we only understand it, we only interpret it if we can draw a line through it, that's, I think, misguided. And I think that's going to limit our ability to make progress. Um, another thing is we can only, our brains, you know, we, we can't think about that many things. We're limited in working memory. We can only have like five to nine concepts in our head. You know, the best people, maybe nine, me, maybe five. And so all of our equations have like five terms in it. You know, you have a Schrodinger equation, a Dirac equation, an Einstein equation. We reduce them to the number of terms that we can deal with, right? But there may be equations that you just can't do this for, right? Um, that, that maybe the actual description of nature is so complicated that it's not it's not reducible to five terms in two dimensions. Um, and and that just that just might be uh, what what we need in order to, work, to, to to make progress is to have the ability to go beyond what humans are capable of. Uh, so what do we need to get there? Well, right now, the current state of technology can solve basically textbook physics problems. You know, they can solve undergraduate freshman, sophomore level engineering. Um, and it's trained on books. It's trained on, uh, you know, Chegg and so on. Um, and these are written by people who read books, right? So where does this data that they're creating come from? It's just a bunch of, you know, people solving problems, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's not like there was this, fixed data set that we're training on that was the sort of God-given data set is actually generated by people itself. Um, and when you go from undergraduate, where you have all this well-defined solved problems in the back of your book, to graduate school, where your problems are more amorphous and you don't know how to solve them, what do you do? Well, you have to learn how to train yourself to make your own problems and then solve them and build it up, right? Um, so think about like alpha zero. So it learns to solve chess problems by generating its own trading data. A lot of the physics examples I've shown you were all about generating trading data on your own, solving that, learning the patterns, and then applying them to more difficult situations. So a real key to making progress is breaking things down into smaller pieces um, and, and, and learning how to manipulate those pieces yourself and then build up um, um, to more complicated solutions. Um, large lightning balls are very close to this. They're close to being able to train themselves like uh, alpha zero is to be better physicists. Uh, and we're very close to doing that. And I don't see any real limitation to going between the undergraduate level, the graduate level, it's just a little bit more, more complex. Um, so what happens next? So suppose we get this working, we have augmented intelligence and we become 10,000 Einsteins and we improve things. But eventually when you go beyond what we can visualize and understand, uh, machines might need to do it without us, right? And where do we go from that? And then there's a really deep philosophical question that I'm happy to discuss with people, which is if a machine understands the theory of nature, but we don't, is that is that worth it? Right? Is it or should we be satisfied that nature is understood if a machine can't explain it to us? Now, and I think the answer is yes. And I, I, you know, an example is just, well, there's plenty of things that people understand that I don't understand. So the whole point of like popular science books is that there's someone who understands string theory or, or cosmology better than you do. Uh, and can explain it and then dumb it down. You get the basic idea, but you can't get into the details, right? There's just maybe I maybe I could. So like Fermat's last theorem. Maybe if I spent ten years, I could understand Fermat's last theorem. I'm not going to do that, but but maybe I could, all right? Maybe it would take me a hundred years, right? Maybe to understand the theory of nature, it would take me ten thousand years to understand this, right? There's some limit, and there's some amount of knowledge and study I would need, right? And so if it's, if it takes more than a human lifetime to understand something. I can't do it, but maybe I can understand the idea, right? So maybe if a machine can understand the theory of nature, it can do two things. It can make predictions, quantitative testable predictions, proving that it understands it, and maybe it can dumb it down to a set, you know, project the 2D, draw some lines through things to make a package. Um, you know, and maybe that's the best that we're going to get. Um, so is that what we want? No, but maybe maybe it's the best that we'll get. Um, and, and actually, you know, you can either take a pessimistic view or an optimistic view. I'm optimistic because I think, you know, in, in my lifetime, we've made some progress in theoretical physics, but taking a big step back, it's not clear that we're actually making significant progress towards the goals we want. Um, and it, it, without AI, I would have no confidence that human beings are going to really make progress in the rest of my lifetime. Uh, but because of AI, I'm now optimistic because of the exponential growth that we'll actually see progress 
on these deep questions of fundamental physics, which are indeed largely symbolic um, in, in my lifetime. So I think that's very cool. And we just have to adjust. We have to adapt to the way to think about machines in this context. Um, and I think that we will learn as a choice. We're going to have to learn how to do this. Um, so let me conclude. I'm only five minutes over time, but I'll give plenty of time for, for argument afterwards. Any discussion? <laughs> And uh, so let me just tell you what I was talking about. So the first half of the talk, I gave some examples. I, I really see that the data science has been the key application of machine learning in, 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 in science. And it's been great. And there's still a lot to do. And there's a lot of practice application. But going towards the questions that really that keep me up at night in theoretical physics, uh, we really are symbolic. If you look at FDH and FDH, the papers are symbolic. And how do we, how do we approach that? And I think developing symbolic machinery, the, the ability to manipulate symbols, not just numbers, um, is the first step to doing that. Uh, and so I was exploring this a number of problems. I talked about symbolic search problems, simplifying polyalgorithms of synchronicity, and there's a lot of techniques that are useful for that. Contrastive learning was one I emphasized in transformer networks, this idea of studying ethnic bootstrap, um, string theory, uh, there's, there's progress in mathematics. And the second half of the talk, I just kind of gave you this philosophical view that really AI is here to stay. It's going to help us and we need to embrace it. And the more we use AI, it'll help us do in the short term what we do better. It'll enhance, it'll augment our ability to do theoretical physics. Um, and in the future, eventually, it'll, it'll take over from us once the machines start writing their own code and so on. And we get the singularity, which isn't that far. Um, and, uh, um, and, and when we get to that, maybe it'll be able to kind of dump things down and explain it. And there's no need to have a person be a theoretical physicist anymore. And we can do, you know, other things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but this is, you know, so this may be on the next five year time scale. This is, getting, this is already happening and improved. And this may be, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, but we're almost there. Thanks for waking us up this waking us up this morning. Um, so questions, argumentation, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Professor Short. Uh, thanks for the brilliant uh, presentation. The thing that you mentioned about how uh, in the current ML models have uh, rapidly increased their performance, especially in uh, very interesting fields while also still struggling with something as basic as counting letters in a long sentence has, uh, has been shown by some people like Arne Karpati to be focused more on the embedding problem. And you briefly touched upon that, like in a contrastive learning, you want to uh, project them into a space which is well-defined and uh, disentangled in, in the case of contrastive learning. The, for high energy physics or like other complex uh, theoretical problems where you, see, you already see like a huge potential. Uh, one of the big challenges which machine learning or even the LMs will face right now is the kind of tokenizer that you might want to use and the embedding that you're using that. Because if you, in the case of like from GPT 3 to 4, the big jump was in just understanding how spaces are presented in tokenizer for simple Python prompting. So, um, any ideas, any, because if you, uh, you see very interesting and very uh, positive or optimistic about its usage. So how do we, because if we can use the power of a lot of these visual or uh, LM models, but how do we combine that with specific domain expertise of physics, how to represent certain tokens, how to get from the tokens back to the embedding space. So fine doing it in that respect. So have any ideas and any experiences in that area? Thank um, yeah, so that, that, that's a great question. I mean, there's different aspects to what you're asking. You know, I think that there, there's certain, certain failure modes of these large language models that I think are being improved upon each generation by engineers at Google and OpenAI, which I don't really have much access to or expertise in, but I, I do believe that there, there is systematic progress at least. But the question that maybe I can address is the use of physics domain knowledge yes. to, to, to improve these models. And I think, yes, there, there's tremendous need for people who actually know something about the domain to, to understand how to, what, what an embedding is that, that is more closely related to the actual problem of interest. And I think like a lot of the problems that I was doing in, in symbolic manipulation was really understanding what aspects of these of these expressions you need. So things like with the spinner of you know, mass dimension, little little group scaling, there's properties that you know from physics that you expect to be there. And using that to figure out the machine is learning them and to go back and forth and ask, you know, what, what are the properties related to the questions of interest? So 
So I think that yes, in the short term, having domain knowledge will be critical to, to getting these issues to, 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 to work better. But but in the long term, I think that the, these problems that you're worried about large language models will be solved kind of on their own. And and I think people just have to find the problems and then often they're not that that hard to solve. You know, like Jeff GP3 was able to, you know, do addition. Yeah. Right. And like and now they just have a, a sandbox to do it, right? That was a stupid thing they should have done a long time ago. And then they solved that problem, right? Um, and then now they have trouble. You know, the current limitation is that if you ask it to solve a problem, it can tell you an outline of the steps and then each individual step it can do, but it can't do both, right? It can't break the outline and then break down the steps <laughs> and then put them together. Yep. So it can't solve big problems, but it can solve, it knows how to break it down and knows how to solve the individual problems. So someone just needs to tell it how to combine those, but it's easier said than, than, than done. But I think, you know, the next generations will be getting better and better at solving the stupid things and then we can find out what the harder problems are. And the progress is, is I think, just now. That goes under the category of algorithmic problems that doesn't need that doesn't need more data. It just needs smarter code. Yeah, but, um, I have bad news you to for you, but that is I agree with everything you said. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I have, I have a question. So like you know, also I, I share your like enthusiasm for CLR because it gives us a representation that you can actually maybe learn something because of the compact data space and so on and so forth. And then you um, advertise large language models, but they, I mean, transformers look like they should give you a nice representation, but when you try to understand what's happening, it's that it's not super, super easy to understand what's happening. So, uh, so what do you think is like, you know, the, the, how can we combine the, on the one hand large language models and then transformers and like, you know, um, the, like the, the pew power, yeah. and then the cool representations like CLR, obviously, then learn something. Like, how, how do you want to? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, transformer models are sort of magical. And they work better than than you really have reason to believe they, 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 they should work. And we don't really understand what they're doing. And I think that's going to change. I think, you know, they've been around for a few years. And we just need the next big thing, which will be something that's a little bit more transparent, a little bit more logical, and more powerful than transformers. I mean, my experience in machine learning is that often there's many, many techniques that can achieve this comparable goals. I mean, we see this in the top tag, right? That you have a well-defined problem, and there's many approaches to it. And then then you kind of find a more efficient one and then the, the, the model evolves. So I think as things are developing, we're going to see the technology change into a way that's a little bit easier to understand. And when it's easier to understand, it will be easier to, to improve. We need a couple of more phase transitions, a couple of more paradigm shifts, and new, new, new disruptive advances in, in the machine. So I don't think transformer networks are really that important to really understand because I think that they're going to go away within the next few years. And we'll be replaced by something else, but that's just extrapolation based on any, any experience. So, I, it doesn't, you know, again, my, my practical approach is you try it out if it works, don't ask too many questions, you know, <laughs> ask the questions when it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it goes so fast. If you start asking too many questions, there's nobody to write the paper. Um, hey, I have a question on the second half of your talk. So, how agentic do you think this future AI physicist should be? One one version is that um, it can conceive of an experiment and maybe even lobby the NSF and talk to models in China and Europe. The other is that it's confined to its data center and you, it's an oracle that you can ask questions. Uh, well, it's a matter of time. I think for, for the immediate future, it'll be agentic. I think that we're gonna have to, to, to work with the machines and you need, you're not gonna have a machine suggest an experiment without a person involved. Um, but, but I mean, that's an exciting area of development is machines proposing experiments. We're not, we're not there yet, um, but they're involved in the experiment design uh, um, in, 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 in many ways. But I think that, that you know, going forward, it's still going to be human sense. Like, we have to decide what the right problems are and what are the interesting approaches and machines will be helping us do it. Um, and then we'll slowly see the smooth transition between us helping them and them helping us. And it'll be a little bit confusing, and eventually we'll be just trying to figure out what they're suggesting and translate their their proposals into something that that's actionable. Um, uh, more broadly, the question of how to actually interrogate nature using machines is a deep one because this is all very abstract, and it's not clear how you know what like can, can they design a better experiment? Like, do we need more data, more experiments, more information from nature, or is the information there? In theoretical physics, this is something we constantly um, um, struggle with. But machines could, in principle, play a role. I don't really see the path towards doing that, and I don't know, you know, if it's going to happen. But, but yeah, those are interesting things. But I, yeah. 
they're, they're far enough away that I can make a concrete prediction. So just in the interest of time, we're only going to take one more question. Um, maybe we can join me at the front to start getting you, you set up, but um, one last question. Yeah. <laughs> so, filling up the last question, let's say this all comes to pass in 50 years, you know, GPT 7 had the theory of everything. So, what, what's our human role? What do we as theoretical and practical people, what's left for us to do? Can we do anything? Do we have jobs? You know, again, going going back to you know Stephen Hawking wrote, wrote a book, right? So you're not doing what he's doing, right? So it's nice that he does it, and you do something else, and you read his book. I mean, I mean maybe we won't be doing theoretical physics anymore. Um, I think that's okay. You know, we're just not smart enough. Yeah. You know, again, we're we're this is what theoretical physics looks like these days, and it's just not not we're not where we want it to be, and it may just be we're done. You know, this is as far as we can get. Unless we wait another millions of years to evolve, you know, we need to go beyond Homo sapiens, but that takes a while. Technically, you're on the <laughs> There are two knights on the and the knight is on the side. <laughs> <laughs> they're cats. I mean, if you want to. That's a micro question. Yeah. It's, it's, it was talking about your SR uh, part. Oh, okay. So, uh, about the convergence. So, how can you comment a little bit on what do you use exactly? Do you use AI five? Do you use a uh, high SR? You know, and, and uh, um, uh, do you always for the for instance for the density amplitude, uh, uh, you know, the composition there in physics? Do you always uh, uh, get the same answer? And 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 how do you test the convergence? But this is technical. Right? So, uh, yeah. So so there's been so we don't always get the same answer. We do different approaches. We can use a beam search. Where we take like five answers and answers are the same, and there's ways to check if any of them are the same. You can do numerical checks because the spherical listening amplitudes are actually functions of momenta. You can evaluate the numerically compared with the original expression, and if any of those agree, then we have the right answer. Um, there's other ways you can have probability. There's different ways to evaluate what it is, and if you look at the paper, you should see all the details. But all this is in your paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Great, Paul. Thanks for the for the provocative uh, start today.